You're going to talk a bit about the China strategy. Let me kick off with that. You're here in the Chinese capital. What is your grand vision for Credit Suisse in China in, say, five years' time? Uh, I'm always very pleased to be here. Uh, China is a, is a fantastic country, a fantastic economy that has had a fantastic success. We, Credit Suisse, have been very successful in the rest of Asia, and we're now coming to China to replicate, frankly, the, the success uh, we've had elsewhere and uh, implement our strategy. So what we want to be is a, a very significant player in the Chinese economy, because in the end, we only succeed if we do um, what we do for the economy. We are a bank for entrepreneurs. We were a bank created by an entrepreneur. And we believe that the success we've had in Switzerland, supporting entrepreneurs in Switzerland, supporting Swiss companies, we can replicate at the service of the Chinese economy, supporting Chinese entrepreneurs and the, the growth and success of the Chinese economy. I, I know that you're keen to take a majority stake in your JV here, 51% potentially. Mm -hmm. How close are you to that, or what is the time frame? Uh, we are having very positive conversations with, uh, with our partners. Effectively, we'd like to, to invest more in China. We want to do much more here. Uh, but don't forget that we don't only have that joint venture. We also have the asset management uh, joint venture with ICBC. We're already number two in asset management in China through that joint venture. So the, the, the securities venture is another, another asset that we, we value very much here. Is, is the application in? With the regulators, we I will not uh, understand why you should you would ask, but I will not uh, give you more specifics. But I was with uh, the CSRC this morning at a very very positive meeting with Chairman Liu, and uh, we're doing everything we need to do to to be again a significant player in, in Chinese economy over time because those things take time. Uh, we're very patient. We'll, we'll we'll do things the right way. We have been in China for 60 years. We came here in 1949. 48. Uh, so, um, you know, and we're here for, uh, I would say, uh, eternity. Do you, do, do, you, do you get any sense that regulators here are going to be favoring European firms over their U.S. Um, rivals as a result of the tensions between Beijing and Washington? I think regulators here will do what uh, regulators will do everywhere, which is to work for the development of a Chinese economy. And that's your job. And it's my job to help them achieve those objectives. So, uh, uh, they've done very well. If you look at where China came from, where China is today, I don't think there is any reason to doubt the capacity, the capabilities of the Chinese regulators. And I think the, the opening that's on the way is extremely positive. I think it was um, always part of what they wanted to do. They wanted to build first uh, very strong Chinese institutions in the financial sector, which they have done, and then open up, which frankly I cannot blame them for. From a Chinese perspective, it makes perfect sense. Do they need to be opening up at a faster pace? Uh, look, we are business people. We always want things to happen at a faster pace. But I, I honestly, I have always been impressed by the quality of the leadership in China, the quality of the decision making. And I, I have absolute trust in them. And I, I, we, will, uh, we will follow the liberalization at the pace that they will dictate, just out of respect. Does part of the longer term vision for you mm. in China include mm. onshore wealth management. It does, it does, it does. Um, because ultimately, again, just to be concrete, um, we, I was with a client yesterday, we've helped him develop his company, we've helped him finance his company at different rounds, it's now become a huge company, we put him on the stock market, his share price has now trebled, and the discussion was targets. He wants to do M&A in Europe and in America, and we have a list of targets for him, and we had a very productive discussion. That's what we do, and we also manage his private money. So this, this model that we have at Credit Suisse of wealth management with strong investment banking capabilities is extremely powerful because it allows us to develop privileged relationships with uh, the, the people who create value in these economies, create jobs, create you know, exports, uh, and helping them fund their business, helping them manage their wealth is what we do best, and it's a win-win. It's good for them, it's good for their country, it's good for the economy, and it's good for credit users. Are you able to give us a sense of a time frame for the onshore wealth management um, business? Honestly, um, not that directly. We, will, we are taking all the necessary steps to do that. But, uh, you know, very often in those things, the, the most important thing and the limiting factor is people. Uh, businesses are run by people. So as you want to build your capabilities in a given geography, you also need to find the right people. And that's often what takes the, the most time. And that's most of our focus. And that is not something, if there's a trade-off between finding the right person 
and taking more time, I always go for finding the right person. That is so much more important in running any business than uh, an artificial timetable. So we want to make sure we have the right resources in place to drive the business forward, and it will take the time it takes. So personnel is a key challenge for you well, everywhere. here? Everywhere. It's and, not and just it, a comment it, about China, sure. a- anyway. Uh, yeah. And in terms of targets for headcount mm. in China, you give us, to give us an indication in the next, say by the end of 2019, where would you like to be? No, we're, we're, again, we're not, we're not going to express the, the, the targets in those terms. I think by the end of 2019, we, we want to have strengthened our talent here and our capabilities. Uh, look, the, the opportunity is not going to go away. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough, I visited China the first time now 35 years ago exactly, in the summer of 80, 84, 34 years ago. And, uh, you know, the opportunity was already big, it's only gotten bigger. Um, it's not a question of six months. What we, we need the right structure in place, we need to make sure that we have the support of the regulators, and uh, we will then uh, do what we do, which is uh, to advise our clients. And are you investing significant capital in China to make that happen? Over time, yes. The, the good thing about the Credit Suisse is that we're now um, almost at the end of our restructuring. Uh, we, we are growing again, growing revenue very strongly. We've cut our costs very significantly. We've cut our risk. We've strengthened our capital. we dealt with all our legacy issues. So you have a, a refreshed, re-energized Credit Suisse with significant profitability, able to invest for the long term. Hmm. Switching the focus to hmm. trade, hmm. we've heard from the U.S. president hmm. just in the last 12 hours or so, hmm. speaking to Bloomberg, he said that hmm. he was going to push ahead with these additional tariffs hmm. on $200 billion worth hmm. of Chinese goods, potentially as soon as next week. Hmm. How damaging hmm. potentially could that be? Are we at a point now hmm. of no return in this relationship? Well, the, look, I, um, I mean, I, my personal beliefs are are public and well-known. I mean, I, I believe that trade is a very good thing. I believe it's a force for good in the world economy, uh, and the evidence for that is overwhelming. Um, it's, uh, if you look at the development of the last 40, 50 years, uh, which has lifted hundreds of millions of human beings out of poverty, trade has played a, a huge part in that. So I am uh, pro-trade. Um, and I think that uh, in the long term, the, the trends that promote trade are... Uh, very real and, uh, and, and not stoppable. So the economy is very strong globally. Uh, the U.S. economy is very strong. Uh, if you look at Asia, it's very strong. You can, uh, you've talked a lot about synchronous growth, and even Europe has recovered, so things are, things are really good. Trade will have an impact, but it will have a, a marginal impact. The, the main risk we have is a sentiment, that uh, uh, it starts affecting negatively sentiment, and sentiment is important because it drives consumption and it drives business investment. And if business investment starts going down, then you can get into uh, a less positive scenario. But for the time being, I remain positive. Um, I think that, yes, there is tension on trade, but it's, it's relatively contained, and the, the most of the world economy is still, is still powering ahead. Would you concur with the likes of the mm. CEO of Moller Merz, mm. the CEO mm. of BHP Billiton, mm. who say that mm. long term mm. the U.S. is going to lose out from this? No, I think long term actually these issues will be resolved. I think long term we'll go back to a very positive scenario where everybody's trading with everybody based on their comparative advantage and the world economy uh, is doing better. I, I don't believe in a, in a doomsday scenario. I think there is a lot of uh, negotiation and bargaining and. Of course, the interests at stakes are huge, so you would, you would expect that there would be some tension and some tough negotiations, but nobody wants uh, um, a negative outcome. So I, I, I have to rely on, on the wisdom of uh, the key decision makers in those matters in mm. the end. Uh, Trump also said that he was looking at, again, pulling out of the WTO. Mm. How much of a blow would that be to the global trading system? Would that be a point where you'd stop and say, okay, this has taken a significant oh, look, turn to the uh, at, at this point, it's not helpful to speculate. I think, uh, as we speak, the U.S. is part of the WTO. The WTO, after the GATT, uh, has been a force for good again in the world economy. Everybody can see that. Um, and uh, the lessons from the 1930s are very clear. Uh, I think we're talking about trade war. What we may have is maybe trade skirmishes, but not trade wars. We saw trade wars in the 1930s, and we're very, very, very far from you, that. 200 billion additional next week. You could get a, a point where you've got 250 of Chinese goods, potentially 110 it's billion. Not, it's, it's, you know, this goods. is not the end of the story. You've seen a, a, an agreement with Mexico being announced after all the worries there were around NAFTA. So these things get resolved. You may go for... Uh, 
a point of high tension through discussions, or, but I think in the end they get resolved. Do you think the agreement around this revamped version of NAFTA that you mm. just mentioned there, mm. if Canada gets on board, does it have a positive macroeconomic impact on the US or is it marginal? Oh, look, I, as I've said, I believe in trade. Trade is good for the economy. Mm -hmm. So every time we, we move towards a more stable, more predictable, more open system, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good thing. But as, as Credit Suisse, what we see again is a lot of strength uh, across geographic areas. Uh, these are actually very much a benefit of globalization. You see, a, you see a lot of countries doing actually pretty well, uh, and that's a good thing. How are your clients positioning in this environment? Um, what you see lately is less um, activity, less transaction, um, definitely uh, lower volume. Um, you have different. You have to look at different things. If you think about FDI foreign direct investment and long-term flows, they're actually quite stable, and they react much less to those short-term fluctuations. Now, tactical investment decisions are a different matter, and people have been a bit more cautious. Certainly what we saw in July and, and August is a bit more a bit more caution, and you also see uh, deleveraging, uh, because people see the yield curve uh, moving up uh, and uh, are worried about their level of indebtedness, and so we see a bit of deleveraging. But again, uh, on the one hand, that's what you see. On the other hand, uh, it creates new opportunities. Mm -hmm. The fact that people suddenly uh, are more concerned gives you opportunities to sell them hedges, you know, downside protection. So uh, we continue to have very good levels of activity. We just do different things. And that's why you want a broad platform, because what makes you successful at different points in the cycle is different. Early phases of the cycle, everybody wants to grow, everybody wants to invest, everybody wants equity. At later stages, people think about uh, wealth preservation, downside protection, and that's, that's more where the dialogue is these days. Hmm. You obviously know China well. You've been coming mm -hmm. here for many years. Mm -hmm. And, you, and you've been focused on the APAC region as well, more broadly. In terms of what we're seeing in, in, in the Chinese economy, what's mm. playing out, for example, mm. the weakness of the renminbi, mm. uh, do you expect the Chinese currency to continue to depreciate? Is that inevitable now, given those tensions? Ooh, I, uh, I um, have a very long habit of not making short-term FX predictions. <laughs> it's really... It's really, uh, it's really uh, uh, FX is fascinating because of all the tradables. It's the one that is the most exposed uh, to everything. Right? So trying to predict effects in the short term is like making an attempt to predict everything, which mm. generally is... But it, are you watching the actions fail. coming out of the PBOC? So, is that, uh, is that what, 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 what I think about effects, and this is really very well supported by economic theory, long term, exchange rates are the most closely correlated with GDP growth. So you can expect over a very long term, countries the currencies of countries that grow faster to appreciate, and the country, currencies of countries that cannot grow to depreciate. In the meantime, anything can happen, because it's just impacted by, by, so, by so many things. So, uh, um, yeah, I think the, the PBOC is, is very uh, competent. Uh, I think what we've seen lately is uh, a, a kind of form of easing, which I think is timely, and I think is a, is a right thing to do to support the the Chinese economy, whether it's through um, uh, helping with credit conditions or also helping infrastructure investment, which I think in H2, 18 will, will, will pick up and support Chinese growth. The, the concern to that, of course, mm. is that you're going to get a misallocation of resources, that the debt pile is going to start to creep up. Is that, uh, is that a viable concern for you? No, it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable concern to have. Uh, I, I still think that the, the track record of China overall over the last 30, 35 years is, is, is pretty good. So uh, uh, of all the governments in the world, that's not the one I would have the least confidence in, in terms of their ability to, to make the right decisions. Mm. Mm. Uh, in, in terms of the volatility that we're seeing in the mm. emerging markets, mm. whether it's mm. Argentina or Turkey, mm. Brazil or South mm. Africa, for a variety of different reasons, how do you see that volatility playing out. You've seen the currencies impacted, you've seen the, yeah. the equity markets yeah. here. Is that going to continue a, to play it's out? A, it's a very important point. Um, my view has always been that the, 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 the well-managed economies are safe. Okay? There is no emerging, there's no such thing as emerging markets. <laughs> well-managed and less well-managed economies. Uh, uh, economies that have a current account surplus, but have their public finances in order, so don't run a fiscal deficit, and have significant foreign exchange reserves are safe. And the market, uh, when people fear contagion, 
very, they are wrong. There's no contagion for, from poorly managed economies to well managed economies. Uh, the, 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 the countries that have gotten under pressure uh, were, uh, it was, it's easy to understand why. You know, it's because they have a significant, uh, often a current account uh, balance problem, and that makes them vulnerable. Uh, it's not because they're emerging markets. Uh, it's important to have, uh, to manage the fiscal uh, situation responsibly. It's important to be in a current account surplus, and it's important to have uh, significant foreign exchange reserves. And you will find that a lot of emerging economies are in that position. Uh, the ones that have come under pressure, uh, whether it's Turkey or Brazil, have more fundamental uh, macroeconomic problems. I was in Argentina two months ago, and I met all the senior authorities there. And uh, yeah, it's clear that Argentina has some real challenges uh, to, 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 to deal with. But to extend that to other emerging economies is, is, is uh, too simple. So in terms of the contagion from, mm. from Turkey in particular, mm. you think that risk is being believe, overplayed? I, I, I don't believe there will be material contagion over time. Uh, in the short term, there's always a, a kind of very strong, spontaneous reaction, but uh, it's not justified. And the impact on European banks? It's, con it's manageable. Banks are in a much different situation than they were uh, back then, you look at the size of the Turkish economy, with all respect, and I, I'm a Turkey bull, I've done in previous careers uh, very good transactions in Turkey, uh, I'm actually very positive medium long term on Turkey. Um, you can talk about why, but the demography is one of the key reasons why. So, um, no, the banks have uh, reasonable exposure, the banks we're talking about are, have reasonable exposure to, uh, to Turkey and it will be manageable. Has Credit Suisse had to unwind any positions in Turkey? No, we, we have minimal exposure to Turkey, very minimal. In, in terms of Italy, we, we've seen concerns there about that their debt, mm. of course. Mm. There was reasonable appetite for yesterday's auction, mm. but the yields have, have picked up slightly. Mm. Are the markets underpricing the risk coming out of Italy? Hmm. That's a tough question. I, I, I'll be very cautious in any situation to say that the market is, is mispricing, is mispricing things. Um, look, we, we, I am not close enough to that situation to really have a, a strong view. I think we, we, need to, we need to see how things evolve in the coming months in, in Italy and watch it closely. Would you expect the ECB potentially to step in at some point to support their well, the ECB, funding needs? The ECB has very clear objectives, try to manage inflation and promote financial stability, and I think it will, it will do what, uh, what's necessary. We've seen... Uh, over time, I think the euro is, is very resilient. I think that the political will behind the euro... I was never worried when uh, we were talking about Portugal, uh, Ireland, Greece, etc., and Spain. Um, I was never concerned, um, because history is very important. Uh, Europe has a, a rich history, and I, I, I think that all the decision makers are, are determined to do whatever is necessary in the end to ensure that the euro uh, continues. Mm. Uh, switching focus to the UK mm. and the inevitable question on Brexit, mm. it seems like the deadline uh, for coming to an agreement has been pushed back, and that raises potentially the risks that there is a, a hard out for the UK, that there mm. is no deal. Mm. You must have thought through and game planned this. What, what would you say the odds are now of a of a messy breakup, a messy divorce? No, look, I'm not going to call the odds. Of, uh, we were all asked by the ECB to present uh, plans in case of hard Brexit, which we've done. Um, everybody expects hopes that there'll be a, a reasonable outcome here again to, to, to things which is in everybody's interest. Mm. Uh, it, it, we've heard from uh, Deutsche Bank's CEO mm. talking about consolidation mm. in the European mm. banking mm. sector mm. and saying that that's an inevitable phase that we're mm. going to go through. Mm. Would you concur with that? Are we, are, we looking, are we getting closer to that point? I think uh, the most important thing in any business is, in the end is growth. Um, we grew revenue 7 percent year on year uh, at Credit Suisse. I believe that you can only succeed as a business if you are riding some kind of secular wave in the real economy. Uh, and for us, Credit Suisse, it's the wealth creation, which is frankly concentrated at the top, and it's serving the entrepreneurs um, uh, that create that wealth. So as long as the company is able to grow its revenue, uh, the pressures for transactions or consolidations are, are much less. So in our case, we're very pleased with how we are. We think that we have enormous growth available. We attracted 40.5 billion of NNA in the first half. Uh, so we really focused on capturing the opportunity in front of us. 
consolidation often is an answer to a lack of growth uh, because then um, it becomes a cost game and companies that cannot grow and don't have any growth opportunities get together and reduce their cost. But that is, uh, I don't think one can shrink its way into greatness. Um, that is not a positive thing. Mm. It's, a, it's an admission of failure. Because we touched on some of these mm. geopolitical issues, mm. whether it's Brexit or the new government in Italy, relatively new government, mm. I wonder what proportion of blame potentially the wealth management industry should take for the rising inequality that's fed some of these populist movements uh, and some of these tensions. Is that something that the wealth management industry should be acknowledging? No, no, it's not how I look at things. This is why I started by talking about the bank for entrepreneurs. Uh, what, for me, what we are doing is helping entrepreneurs be successful. And... Um, Entrepreneurs create all the jobs in the economy, whether it's in the healthcare sector or it's in retail or it's clothing or it's food. Uh, so I'm actually quite uh, excited about that form of contribution to the economy. Uh, every country, every economy needs successful companies to have quality jobs for its population. And that's why I go back to Switzerland. Switzerland, if the fear you're expressing was true, Switzerland would not be the richest country on the planet on a per capita basis. Okay. It has, a, it has a, the three largest uh, companies in Europe by market cap are Swiss. Roche, Novartis, and Nestle, all above $200 billion. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an economy that is led by entrepreneurs, run by entrepreneurs. Unemployment is 2.9%, and the, the budget is in surplus. Okay. So <laughs> I think the, the, the model works mm. of having... Uh, successful small and medium-sized enterprises that export in the whole world and grow and are successful, and we could list here of uh, the Swiss companies. Um, you know, everybody knows their name. So, um, and actually, also Switzerland is the most egalitarian country in Europe. Mm. If you measure wealth inequality and differences in in income, so uh, I don't see the, the correlation or the connection between wealth management and inequality. I think what matters is for economies to be successful, for jobs to be created, mm -hmm. and when entrepreneurs, I know you want to stop me, I'm going to close. When entrepreneurs are doing well, it's good for everybody. Let, for me, let me switch focus to yeah. APAC because okay. we're, we're running short of time. Yes. I want to get your views on this. When you took over in 2015, you wanted to double the private banking assets under yes. management. I think we got to 37% last year, and then net profit. Last year was slightly lower and lower than it was in 2014. So how do you rectify no, that? No, 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 no. We said uh, uh, measure of success is not is not absolute profit; it's the quality of the profit. Mm. Okay. We said that uh, we would shift the mix towards wealth management. We now at we were 30 percent wealth management, 70 percent investment banking. We're now 65 percent wealth management, 35 percent uh, investment banking. And it's my strongly held belief that the wealth management profits are higher quality. And on the profit. We said in um, 2015 we would treble, we would double the profit in three years. We've actually trebled it in two years. So uh, maybe we can't reconcile the numbers here, but um, mm. yeah, the strategy has been very successful. Uh, and we did, never said we'd double the AUM. We said we'd double the profit. Um, and we've done that already. So we had to adopt a new target, a new higher target for profits. Uh, and we passed 200 billion of assets under management for the first time. We were at 130 when I arrived. So. Uh, very successful, very successful strategy, but it's only the beginning because the potential here is think that we've done that without a non presence in China, uh, which is now something we're starting to develop.